Uh, as introduced, my name is Chris Cataldi. Um, I'm CEO and co-founder of a company called Genvid Technologies, um, and I'll be talking today about interactive streaming and the, the future of gaming as we see it here at Genvid. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know Genvid, I'll be doing a brief introduction, then jumping into what we think is the opportunity for game developers and others in the ecosystem, and then jumping into some direct um, examples of some partners using interactive streaming to engage their audiences and, and do some cool things. And then I uh, hopefully we'll have some, some really cool Q&A at the end. So what is Genvid? Uh, who is Genvid? I think you always need to know who you're hearing from. And uh, we've been around for just uh, over four years now. Uh, we started with four people. Uh, all of us from the games industry space, mostly, most recently from a company called Square Enix. Uh, we're involved with the, the cloud gaming subsidiary uh, called Shiro Technologies. And we've grown into a team of more than 50 people in six different locations in four, in this case now just three countries. Oh, well, depends on how you look at it, but in many countries uh, spanning North America, Europe, and, and Asia. Uh, we've, uh, in the last few weeks, uh, announced some additional financing from some very welcome and awesome partners, uh, be it Hui in China, Samsung in Korea, uh, Entity Docomo in Japan, and who are joining our existing venture capital investors, uh, be it Mar um, Galaxy Interactive, Makers Fund, Horizons Ventures, March Capital, and OCA. I always like showing uh, a, a group of, uh, this slide uh, it showcases the, the, the awesome group of people that I work with um, in, in those offices. Uh, if it wasn't for them, I would just be a crazy person ranting. And because of them, I'm a crazy person ranting with some actual uh, meat on, on my rents. So thank you for all of them. Uh, I think you'll see the, the variety in terms of ethnicity, uh, diversity of, of background, and, uh, experience, age, gender, you name it, it's there. We think it's extremely important uh, in able to, to let us, uh, you know, tackle these, these new experiences, what we're trying to do. Uh, the media has covered us. If you haven't heard of us, I think in terms of public uh, streams, we're, uh, we've been partnering with the top esports broadcasters as well as uh, interactive streaming and stats uh, uh, experts like Stats Helix to create uh, interactive experiences on Twitch for the Counter-Strike uh, majors, uh, for London major, the Berlin major, uh, et cetera. Um, I can talk more about that later. So the, the title of the, of, the, of the talk is um, Interactive Streaming in the Future of Gaming. And um, I think it's important to explain what we mean the future of gaming is. Uh, and the the best slides I had for this actually date back to our first fundraising slides just over four years ago, uh, when we took kind of our, our, our vision for where the game industry was going and, and, and made, it, um, made it a little bit more crystallized. And so, sorry, I'll go back, by the way. Uh, we see the game industry on a progression from uh, th Experience 1.0, is what we call Experience 3.0. Although we don't use this, this vernacular anymore, I think it's interesting to, to visualize exactly what we mean. Experience 1.0, when games started, were single player experiences, uh, not really shared with anyone except people who were directly in the room. Uh, and they were made on a purpose built set of hardware that was local. Uh, what, when we went from Experience 1.0, 2.0, and 2.0, we uh, uh, defined as this multiplayer component where people are still playing the same game. Um, the game hardware runtime hardware is a little bit more modular, but people are able to interact on that uh, with each other, with people from different kinds of, of backgrounds. But they're still fundamentally playing the same kind of game on the same kind of hardware. Uh, um, and where we're on the tradition transition point now between 2.0 and 3.0 is this idea that we have people interacting via game uh, experiences on different kinds of hardware. And in fact, the kinds of game interactions are having is also quite different. So if you're playing Fortnite on, uh, and right now we're in a transition, we're in a transition between 2.0 and 3.0. So most of the facets of 3.0, we're still trying to facilitate here at Genvid uh, and, and with our partners. Uh, we're still pretty much in the 2.0, but you're starting to hear uh, these ideas of cross play. Uh, people, uh, what, what is the, you know, what will game uh, interactive, you know, element for, for example, Fortnite, you know, you have cross play between mobile, PC, online, uh, all, uh, and, and console. Um, 
yeah, what we're trying to understand here is what, what can we facilitate more here? And uh, for the most part, the, the gaming um, experience on mobile um, shouldn't be the exact same as it should be on PC or console, mostly because they're different kinds of hardware. And for games to be um, specifically successful, they need to cater to the individual hardware runtime that they're on. And uh, while some games lend themselves more towards that, other games you can't directly you know, expect to, to have the same kind of seamless interactivity, and we're trying to address that. Um, where we see games going with, with uh, trends in connectivity, processing power, and, and what we call evolving play style, is new kinds of games that are, are ubiquitous access, that have multiple levels of meaningful engagement, and then are, are just massively social and massive participation. Uh, and there's, we see a gradient of, of interaction that isn't just play. Uh, and this is an opportunity for everyone in the ecosystem because play has defined the gaming industry up until now and will continue to define the gaming industry, but it shouldn't limit the gaming industry. And uh, to talk a little bit more about that, I think you need to see uh, exactly what we do. So in, in general, we see gaming as a uh, component of what we see as the uh, you know, the, the, the conflation of uh, two very big types of, of interactivity or, or, or content, games and media. So traditionally, games have been, you know, uniquely interactive and focused on a specific demographic, whereas media has been not necessarily interactive, but more, more mass audience. Uh, and interactive streaming as, as, you know, whether you're thinking of Bandersnatch or you're thinking of all of these, um, you, you can even talk about the, the Zoom revolution as an example of streaming that's interactive, right? I'm talking here, people are asking questions. Um, long story short, we see um, both sides moving towards each other. Games are trying to become more mass market. Media is trying to become more interactive and interactive streaming itself is a really cool, interesting, uh, harmonious uh, confluence of the two. And it's an opportunity therefore there. Um, but in order for games to fully disrupt, and, and we would get generally think that the game developers are in the driving seat here, we need to take some hints from what we uh, see to be success in traditional media. Uh, and traditional media has a, again, if you go back to the idea that traditional media is more massive and more and more participatory, uh, there's a service design that's inherent there that games currently don't have. And that's, in general, a focus beyond just player. Uh, and so one example I like to start with is what we see with, uh, with sports is one kind of media, right? Everyone grew up playing sports. No one thinks, um, you know, we have uh, a larger view of what it means to be an, uh, a sports fan that isn't just someone who plays sports. And because that's because there's an entire service design around that. So there are people playing in the stadium in the physical world, right? Um, then there are people who pay money to go to the stadium. Uh, and and th these are the people who have the most highest per capita uh, revenue and, and also usually the most highest uh, cost per, per, per user. And then there's the aggregate uh, largest demographic, which is people at home. But there's a service design that goes from player, participant, and viewer. And the player, in many cases, is just a content creator for the rest of the funnel. If you juxtapose that against digital, uh, for games in this case. We have people playing, the participant experience doesn't really exist, then we jump directly to viewers. Uh, and whereas the participant experience for, for regular media in the sports case is the core uh, axis on which the viewer experience is made. So for example, a participant experience in a, in a football stadium, an American football stadium, um, you have you know, the people who are nearest to the field, you have people with the best angles, the most access to uh, the play, the live players, and then the people at home are watching facsimiles of that in different camera angles, zooming into the players, the same way a participant does in the stadium physically. Uh, and so there's a service design that's based around the participant experience that the viewers at home uh, are able to enjoy. Uh, in the digital world, we kind of jump directly from player experience to viewer experience for the most part today, right? And so we're just literally watching the, the player view for everything. And uh, that's not necessarily the, the best example. Uh, and so therefore, uh, right now we have an artist of market, which is the viewer. Uh, the, the audience is large and getting larger. And there's always this, this discussion about what it is to, to, to watch video games. Uh, long story short, developers today are just starting to get 
uh, comfortable thinking about viewers as a part of their ecosystem, uh, and which is why it's pretty cool that we're able to, to talk about this uh, here. So again, uh, if we were to make a real world sports analogy of it, uh, what we're watching today, uh, what we're interacting with today as non-players is pretty much the, uh, a worse experience of the viewer. Uh, we're seeing the player, sorry, of the player. We're seeing the player's perspective. We're able to kind of jump around from those. We're see, able to see replays, but we're not necessarily able to see the whole dynamic um, you know, experience that the people in the stadium would see. And I apologize for jumping from football to, to baseball, but in America, that's what we do. Um, it's more than just camera angles. It's more than just perspective. It's, there's an entire a communication construct that we need to think about. So, um, you know, and here are some examples of, of game genres we work with where, you know, we think fighting games, think MOBAs, think car, uh, CCGs, think MMOs. It's not, you know, fighting games aren't just watching the, the similar thing to MMA. Right, if we're talking about games, right? Uh, it's we, we find when we're thinking about and working with publishers and game developers that uh, because it's fast paced and tactics focused, rather than being something that's just, you know, just take real world examples of MMA or, or boxing and, and let's just put that for, for fighting games like Street Fighter, um, it doesn't quite work the same way because it's just not the same kind of game. Um, it's actually more akin to something like badminton. Uh, where you have a big focus on replay, big focus on, on stats, um, and a big focus on the individuals is there and creating a narrative around that. And in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll fast forward through this, but the same sort of thinking where we don't get fooled by the visuals, we get fooled by the actual core concept of the, of the experience that we're watching actually does come into big play. And uh, the, the golf thing at the end for MMOs, if you think about it, watching an MMO is kind of like golf. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. There's, Anyway, um, so again, we're focused here on, on that participant experience uh, at Genvid and, and a lot of our partners in that by, by focusing on creating a value-driven participant experience that has multiple levels of engagement that affects what they're watching, we can create a really cool funnel that benefits everyone in the ecosystem, be it players and be it viewers. So again, think of the physical world. Players aren't paying, they're being paid for the most part. Participants are paying the most, but having the most fun. And because they're there, because that stadium is there, you have the digital or, or, or the more remote experience that the viewers have at home that in, in this case are driving the most revenue from broadcast rights, sponsorships, et cetera. And if you, again, think that, think that same um, construct juxtaposed that into digital, we have a, cool, a lot of cool opportunity there. And this is just another way of saying players are the current, uh, you know, core, uh, demographic that game developers think about today. They're the only real monetized uh, segment today. Uh, interactive viewers, again, another way of saying participants are the opportunity to create uh, value and revenue driving opportunities um, that developers who are creating, in, in general, game developers, what do we specialize in? We specialize in creating interactive experiences that we can monetize, right? Uh, and so if you, if you think about interactive streaming as a, as a, a subcontract of that, um, we can then create experiences that spectators who may not necessarily have that interactive ability, we can still create uh, awesome experiences for that. So what does that mean? What is interactive streaming, you might ask? And if you haven't checked out any of the, uh, the streams you power for, for Counter-Strike or, or, or followed us in the news, uh, you, uh, let me explain what an interactive streamer can do. Uh, so for example, as a viewer, when I log into any game today, uh, if it's on a Genova enabled stream and I don't know much about the game or I haven't played the game for a couple months, the game has evolved, right? The game is constantly evolving. That's the biggest difference between, again, physical and digital. But sports is that games are living, breathing uh, beings almost, right? And unless you have a high competency that you are gaining and then retaining through practice, you're unable to really understand what you're watching. Uh, so, I, I, you know, it, if you don't, if you look at any other media in the same prism, and uh, you don't know much about sports, you don't know much about movies, uh, you don't know much about music, and that was the, the core, um, you know, hurdle that enabled you to decide whether or not you want to go to a stadium, uh, we'd have much fewer people going to stadiums, much, people, much fewer people going to movies and, and music uh, venues, right? Um, in general, all you need for any of those things is enjoyment, and the idea that when you go there, you don't feel incompetent. And currently, watching games doesn't have that. So imagine going into Counter-Strike and being able to watch uh, not only any angle you want, but literally see the map, see 
all the stats, be able to follow the player you want, and be able to feel like you know what's going on, right? I, you know, I can't say how many times people, when they talk about watching games, they say, it's great, I love the idea, but I don't know what's going on. Uh, and we do that through live viewer guides and, uh, and, and, and you know, personalized data and cameras, but also being able to showcase uh, and, uh, I mean, what's going on in the game. And last but not least, and this isn't, uh, it's becoming more and more actually um, prevalent, but the ability for viewers to actually take what's going on. Again, when you think about why people go to stadiums, it's the big difference there is feeling like you're part of the action. And currently, uh, people, when they're watching games, don't get to really feel like part of the action. And that's going to be able to change. Imagine like horror games type scenarios where you're able to literally reach out and touch the game and affect the players and affect what everyone else is watching. And, and you watching and being there makes that difference. Uh, when thinking about types of interactivity, we like to structure our thinking a little bit. Um, and the, the easiest tier that most developers and, and publishers, when they start thinking about interactivity, go into first is that informational tier. Again, going back to what does it mean to be a competent viewer? Uh, and it, you know, it's it's literally being able to go in and, and see what's going on in the game, being able to toggle on and off uh, what's going on. The, the equivalent of turning up and down volume uh, on your traditional broadcast, we should be able to turn up and down volume of of stats and 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 other data because that's all intrinsically there in the game, but it's kind of uh, currently trapped within the video. Next is customizable, and this is the idea that you have multiple types of demographics: people supporting different players, people supporting different teams people with different levels of literacy in the game, they should all get their own kind of custom experiences. And again, if you think about the digital stadium example, there are people who are there for the home team, the away team, there are people who are there in the corporate box, and they're just people there who are in the bleachers who are just diehard fans, uh, there are season ticket holders, et cetera. So we should be able to give customized experiences for viewers at home the same way. Uh, and in th that case, again, the easiest way to think about it is custom cameras or custom data feeds, or, or, or you know, custom chat or custom cheer. Uh, these are all what we call a customizable tier. And last, and this is where game developers immediately go, it's where we, we, you know, we see the opportunity is influential. And that's the ability for people to literally reach out and affect the game, reach out and affect the player experience, whether it's through cheering, and so that the players can hear and feel that viewers are cheering for them. Again, think of the digital stadium idea, uh, or it's actually going out, reaching out, and throwing a grenade into the middle of a match and seeing what that does. Uh, or it could be a little bit more nuanced than that. It could be buffing or cheering in a way that the NPCs, the boss characters, get uh, more powerful and the viewers are able to enjoy that and also maybe players who are watching that get better drops because viewers are cheering, et cetera. It's quite nuanced, but a cool world. Some examples here. In terms of difficulty, uh, the reason we start with informational and go from that to influential is because informational is much easier. And the, the, the more you get into having dependency on thinking about game design, uh, the, the more work you have to do, right? Because you have to start thinking about balancing, you have to think about what does it mean to let viewers uh, attack players? What does it mean for players to be on the receiving end, et cetera? Um, you know, each game is gonna have to deal with that differently. Um, but there are some easy wins that we can definitely take from informational, in some cases customizable, before we go directly into influential. Um, the question is, okay, why would you want to do it? Well, there are different ways of uh, monetizing, whether we're talking about um, not monetizing it directly at all and using it as a way to funnel more players, or whether it's through a subscription or other uh, brand partnerships, or last but not least, literally uh, le letting uh, viewers be the engine for microtransactions where viewers are buying consumables or buying cosmetics that both affect their own individual experience as well as those who are also taking part in, in that uh, online game. Uh, and by doing that, you know, viewers uh, graduate from becoming just uh, idle uh, viewers to someone who's a participant in the system. And because that participant is, has this example, uh, sorry, this, this experience created for them, uh, viewers are able to actually contribute uh, monet monetarily as well as experientially to, to the content, uh, which is again, what, what if you think of sports, if you think of live theater, if you think of you know, these, these, these events that we, we think about uh, as, as, as massive, um, you know, they have those elements. And with my remaining time, I'm gonna talk about uh, some developers who've used Genvid uh, and then announced Genvid interactivity 
uh, and, and specifically some of the features that they've done and, and what that will lead into Q&A. So I have five developers. I'm going to be jumping through them really quickly in the next uh, about three to four minutes. Uh, I'm happy to, to get Q&A on this, um, but we'll go from there. So first we have um, Impeller Studios. They have an amazing uh, space fighter game called In the Black. Uh, and they're based in the US. Uh, they're, they're a super experienced team that, from the makers of Crisis and X-Wing. And their core focus of the player was a game that was uh, unlike using play, uh, plane physics to model a space game uh, interaction fighting. They wanted to actually use the same kind of um, physics models that uh, space simulators use, like Kerbal, et cetera. Uh, and they made an amazing game that's very difficult for, for people who are watching to play. Um, all these games are still unreleased. They're still in development. Um, so one of the things they did is letting viewers actually go ahead and, and on Twitch or on a streaming platform of, of the, the you know, developer's choice, they're able to go ahead and turn on stats, be able to see how the ship is moving uh, for whoever there is they're watching, be able to see what the weapons are. Uh, that's there. Things that usually you wouldn't be able to to, to uh, um, you know, play around with. Uh, be able to see uh, the, the stats of the live match, who, you know, who's killing who and all those things. Next is the, you know, we're talking about 3D space and we're talking about you know, dog fights and all kinds of crazy things. Um, the cameras are, are very uh, you know, hectic and, and, and frantic. Uh, so if we just watch the player experience or try to do multiple camera angles, you'll never come up with a perfect camera angle. So for, for them, they created a expandable mini map that show, uh, and they spent a lot of time designing the UI for where the viewer would be in, in, uh, watching within 3D space and be able to show the totality of that experience uh, and be able to literally, you know, toggle that on and off, play it, put it wherever in their, their view, viewer UI that they want to put there. Uh, and last but not least, when we're talking about what they thought about full influence, they thought about the viewer be able to cheer for players and players hearing them cheer. Uh, as well as being able to change or influence the, the broadcast campaign. And, you know, cool things here where viewers are able to put wagers and bounties on specific players and, and viewers and players are able to reap the rewards of going ahead and, and uh, if a player uh, executes a, a bounty and, and takes out another player because a viewer has, has used virtual currency to do that, uh, both the viewer who put the bounty as well as the player benefit via in-game in uh, assets. Some really cool stuff there. Next is uh, Retroit uh, by a uh, Helsinki-based developer called Black Block Games. Uh, it's based in the Godot engine. Uh, and, it, and it originally, uh, you know, the, the, the player experience is, is a mobile game. And, and the game here is think of, and I, I, you know, I'm not the developer in this case, but th their vision was for an online 24-7 uh, MMO for mobile game uh, players where viewers, uh, where players are, you know, each, if you think about a game like, uh, Grand Theft Auto, where people are running around in, in, in cars wreaking havoc around the city, uh, each of the people in the cars is a player. And the viewer experience that they created there is something really cool where, where viewers are able to watch live on a virtual CCT, a CCTV feed and you know, look at different camera angles, uh, see kind of what's going on in the city, but also be able to uh, go ahead, jump in, uh, you know, see the, the helicopter view like we're, we're in the US are used to seeing be able to jump in and throw in different kinds of impediments or charge ups. One example is the cash truck where viewers are able to throw in a cash truck. When players hit the cash truck, they get in, in game currency. Um, if there's a pinata, which does similar things, but also blows up uh, and affects the, the player experience. Uh, and then there's the soccer ball, which is again, I think it's because it's a European team, they, they, they like that. And so players are able to go ahead and, and, and you know, in the cars, play around with that. And these are only unlockable by the, by the viewers. Uh, and these are some cool experiences they have there. Next is a Japanese developer uh, called Throw the Warp Court Out. They created a, a Switch game uh, called Demolition Robots. And, and here, it's, uh, if you just think of like a kaiju experience where there are these, these kaiju coming in and wrecking a city, each viewer, in this case, uh, lives in a building and they're setting traps to try to stop the kaiju, the, these, these robot kaiju that come in to, uh, attack the city. Uh, and first, you know, you want to know where you live, you want to know where everyone else lives. So being able to on the stream, click around and, and, and see where everyone is. That's one thing. Being able to go in and throw in traps. And when, if a monster gets caught by the trap, the, the viewer benefits from it. And obviously the monster gets impeded uh, and being able to cheer um, for, for the, the, the robots, etc. 
Next is Don Sawagi. Uh, the English name is Don Swagger. This is another um, uh, Switch game. Uh, it's kind of a crazy Japanese acorn tennis game. Uh, it's really cool stuff. Uh, viewers here are able to just make as uh, anything's happen in the game. Uh, they're able to, uh, you know, click on virtual uh, points that only they see these blue flames. Again, these are superimposed on the stream in a native way. If they get that, they're able to unlock other um, uh, interaction schemas, including cheering, including throwing the acorns that affect the viewer and player experience. Uh, and they're even able to cheer and the, the viewers watching can experience that cheer. Uh, and spiked acorns are these kind of crazy things that affect um, zany things happen. Uh, and last but not least is Dead House Sonata, um, a Canadian-based team working on Lumberyard, uh, Amazon. Uh, and the whole idea here is for this narrative-driven action RPG where the viewer and the player are really interacting with each other. And so viewers can drive what's called a dungeon master mode uh, via voting, a specific viewer is chosen to be the dungeon master and, and literally as a dungeon master be able to upgrade what's going on in the, in the game. Uh, and uh, they're able to s s control NPC movements, control traps, do all kinds of crazy things um, that affect the players and, and the experience. And it's only unlockable by these viewers. Uh, a lot of examples here of doors and just literally think about everything a, a, a dungeon master can do. Now someone on Twitch could do that. Um, and so we're still early. Most of these games are still in development. Um, most of the interactivities currently focus on esports, um, but developers in the driving seat and, and, and we at Genvid are really interested in, in seeing what we can do to drive this transition from just play to interactive viewing being, being a part of that system and driving any kind of ecosystem. With that, I think I've got two minutes of Q&A of which I'm happy to you, you perfectly timed it. You went right up to the edge. You go, you've, you've got up at 5.30. You demand as much time as you damn well want, Chris. <laughs> I appreciate um, that. So, um, yeah, we've got some questions. I think it's brilliant. I'm, 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 it's really exciting um, how, how, you know, there's a whole new, as you say, a whole new era, a whole new part of the games world where players can generally interact in, 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 in kind of esports or live kind of competition. I, I think it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's fascinating. And right now, of course, there's a lot more people looking for engagement than there, there ever has Absolutely. been. Absolutely. So. I mean, I'll, I'll just briefly want to say one thing. I think, um, at least in the US, we've been watching lots of uh, entertainers who are used to live audience interaction, whether it's our, our late night shows or comedians or, or what have you. And they're you know, having to really, really quickly learn how to, what it is to be a Twitch streamer yeah. <laughs> without having any uh, kind of native interaction. And, and you're, you, you saw they would have empty studios first and then they yeah, now they're home. Jimmy Fallon at home I saw that it's kind it, of exactly yeah. it wasn't, and, and it it, wasn't, it's not it's not it, it needs a bit more help it was the first couple were a bit like okay you're there with your kids that's well, well, I mean, for you know, you, well, well, well it's not the the best um kind of driver forward I, I think what we're, we're the people are coming out of work work to see that oh we don't have the right uh tools to create these, yeah. these experiences that aren't there in a physical way and cool. I, you know, it's going to be more and more going on. And I look forward to, to, to be able to drive that. And, and the rest of the speakers today, I'm, I'm, I will be, even though it's 5.30 for me, I'll be staying on. You'll be watching, watching them. While uh, you're changing, changing nappies. Um, no, I, I will. I will. Fauzi's waiting in the wings from Dice, but she'll yeah. be in shortly. So I'm not by, uh, Chris, I'm going to give Chris's time. Don't worry, everyone will get their time. Those can, it's not a regular PGC. We have a bit more time. So we won't yeah. be rushing off the stage after five minutes. Um, <laughs> So I've got a question here saying, I've been a Stardew user from day one and I'm really impressed with how it works. But and this is a Stardew thing. I'm, I'm less impressed with how expensive even old titles are in the store. What can we do to prevent greedy platform holders from price gouging? I know that's not really your service, but I guess- Well, I mean, I, I, I worked with Cloud Gaming for a long time. I think uh, without casting dispersions or, or picking winners and losers or, or, or anyone, I think in the end of the day, when we go from a physical based media to digital media, um, before we even went online, um, when we change media types, uh, enough value has to be there. So we can't just focus on catalog. We need to make sure that people who are, are payers are, are, are feeling that they're getting value for their money. Whether yeah. or not that means a subscription pay, pay for eat all you can eat or not really um, depends on the, the kind of strategy for each company. I, I do believe that um, the promise of City and, and all, for all cloud gaming isn't just recycling old catalog or being another console, but creating new kinds of 
um, experiences that uh, the people who, that are unique to cloud gaming. Uh, and uh, it's still early in that, in that regard. And I think everyone in the space agrees on that. And I think that's the one way you're gonna, you're, to, okay. to answer the, the price gouging concerns is to create new experiences because once a new experience is created, there's new value created from that. Fair enough. I've got, I've got to get at least a couple more questions. Yeah. Now, here's a good question. How, how do you counteract cheating with a view like this? What would stop someone from relaying extra tactical information to players playing the game? As someone's taking this very seriously, because obviously a pro esports player in here. Totally. And the answer to that is how do we do that in the real world? Uh, and, and the answer is we divide who gets access to what data uh, and we create. So, for example, we, we don't stream every baseball game in the world. Right. We just don't do that. We, we stream yeah. certain baseball games uh, and the people who are watching at home, uh, unless there's usually some sort of mitigatable delay that would stop the people you know, in the stadium from hearing what's going on uh, and stealing signs, et cetera. Uh, long story short, there's an entire design around this so that the people um, who are making the experience make it so that you can't cheat. Um, and if you just take today's games and put all of the data there and, and let everyone watch it, there's gonna be this idea, oh, well then you know, I can watch my friend's game and I can help them cheat. Well, the, the easiest answer to that is you take the sports paradigm, you only do it for professional games first, where people are already in soundproof booths sequestered off into a stadium anyway. And so they're not, you can't worry about them cheating. And then as developers get more and more comfortable with playing around with, with dynamics here, um, you, you eventually get to a place where if a player in, gets information from a, from a viewer, it's not cheating, it's part of the game design. <laughs> and, and the game so is, build, is, is it's great. like people yeah. are build like pirating into distribution right it's free play yeah, exactly okay yeah. so um, i've got i've got one final question well, i can combine two into one um mm -hmm. so um and then i'm gonna have to ish, head you into the digital ether to be interacted yeah. with by other people maybe i don't know uh, it, it, it wasn't clear from the talk what services generally offers developers compared compared to developing spectacular themselves and what your monetization model is so maybe maybe they, they say is a technology licensed are you taking account of the audience fueled revenues just explain how you work with the developer. There's also a question Dolan. coming up about how we can get in touch with you. So you've already got a potential partner in here, so it's good. Absolutely. So you can email me at chris at genvidtech.com or go to genvidtech website or speak to one of my, uh, any of my amazing counterparts in, in, in any, of, uh, any of my uh, offices. Um, but also in terms of what Genvid offers, we started as an SDK. Our focus is on creating the tools that game developers can use to create these experiences. Our monetization model is super simple. We make it so that developers don't really have an excuse uh, uh, from that perspective not to use us. We're a simple uh, two-tier system. First tier is licensing. So if you use our tech, we don't pay a single dime until you start broadcasting uh, commercially. Uh, and then it's a, a per unique viewer per month model. So if no one watches, we get no money. If a lot of people watch, we get a very small amount of money. Uh, and then from that, if you start selling things through the stream, um, we do get a revenue share of what people buy through the stream. So if you have consumables, et cetera, that viewers are unlocking, then that's what viewers uh, are paying. And then that's new revenue for you and therefore new revenue for us. We don't touch anything in the player at all. If, if you get a lot more players because of it, we don't, there's no some kind of weird system where Genvid takes um, credit for that kind of stuff. So cool. 